When you look at a CMOS inverter, it looks incredibly simple and it's fairly easy to describe. A lot of people would write the description as an equation, y equals a bar. You could also write it as a table with the input a and the output y and just write these as low, high, and high, low. You can do this with essentially any logic gate. However, the complicated questions start to come up whenever people wonder what exactly does this L mean? What voltage is supposed to be on this input? How much current is flowing into or out of the device? When I connect this up to a load, what exactly is going to happen? What's the voltage at the output? When the input has a switching event, what exactly happens at the output? How long of a delay is there inside of this device? Will the output capacitance affect that? If you add a transmission line onto the end of here, is that going to affect how this device works? There are a lot of questions that can come up and my goal is to try to simplify these and try to give you a basic understanding of exactly how this device works. For the remainder of this video, I'm going to be talking about the basics of diodes and MOSFETs. So if you feel like you're really comfortable with those, you can go ahead and skip to the next video where we talk about exactly how CMOS logic gates work. Assuming you're sticking around, we're going to cover diodes first. For all of this, I'm going to be doing a refresher course. So I'm really assuming that you've had professional courses and you understand the concepts of these very well. And all we're talking about is a refresher to try to remind you of a few things if you're not using these on a regular basis. For a diode, we have an anode and we have a cathode. And the anode is the more positive side and the cathode is the more negative side. So whenever we apply a voltage to our diode, it's going to be in this direction. If the voltage across the diode is approximately zero, then no current is going to flow through the diode. This will be zero. However, if you increase this voltage, it's going to eventually turn on this diode and allow current to flow. So for our purposes, we're going to say that once you've reached the forward voltage of this diode, we'll call that VF. So if you are above VF with the voltage across the diode, then current will flow through the diode and it'll flow completely unimpeded. That's not 100% true. However, for our purposes, it'll get the point across and that's really all we need to know for now. There is one other state of operation for a diode, and that is if you reverse bias the diode. So if we were to apply a negative voltage the way we showed before, or just reverse the polarity of our voltage, then the diode will be off. However, at some point, if you keep increasing this voltage, current will flow. They call this the avalanche or the Zener region of operation and current's going to flow back the opposite way through our diode. So knowing these two things, let's look at what we expect the IV characteristic to be for our diode. Assuming we're starting at zero and we're starting to increase the forward voltage across our diode, at some point that's going to go up and it's going to go off towards infinity. And this is gonna be a relatively low voltage. Let's say something in the vicinity of 0.5 volts. In the negative direction, we're going to see no current flowing until we reach some relatively large negative voltage and that'll shoot off towards minus infinity. That's going to be a voltage that really depends on the design of the diode. However, uh, let's go ahead and just label that as negative 50 volts just to give us a number. Now, there are diodes that are made to be operated in this negative region. Those are called Zener diodes. 
and those are going to have a much lower voltage. So whenever we start going backwards here, putting a negative voltage across our diode, and we turn it on at a much lower voltage, so this is what we might expect from a Zener diode. For example, minus 6.8 volts. In the case of a diode that's specially made for this, it's going to have a different symbol, and that's a diode that has these little fins coming off the side. And typically you're going to see it drawn like this. The, uh, the voltage that it operates at will be written out to the side. Typically you're going to see Zener diodes drawn this way because you're going to expect to see the voltage across them to be in this direction. So we'll have something like 6.8 volts across this diode if current is flowing through it. It's important to remember that if this diode is biased in the opposite direction, then current will flow just like any other diode. This will turn on still at something like 0.5 volts and allow current to flow the other direction. There is one other type of diode I'm going to draw in blue here. This other type of diode is going to turn on at a lower voltage. And these are called Schottky diodes. Schottky diodes are drawn like this. And they act a lot like normal diodes. They're going to have a reverse voltage that's relatively low and they're going to have a forward voltage that's relatively low. A Schottky diode is going to work essentially the same as a regular diode. Whenever you forward bias it, it's going to conduct and allow current to flow in the forward direction. And you can see here that this is happening at a lower voltage. Maybe this is gonna start happening at 0.1 volts or at 0.2 volts. So depending on the diode, you're going to see that be very different. The, the main differences here are they're going to have a reduced forward voltage. They're also going to have more reverse leakage current. So whenever you apply that reverse voltage in this region right here, you're going to have a little bit more current flowing back through the diode in that region. Additionally, you're going to have typically a lower breakdown voltage than a regular diode. Usually it's going to be less than 50 volts for a Schottky diode. Zener diodes are going to be way down here at maybe 5 volts, maybe 3 volts. There are a bunch of different types depending on your application. So I feel like we've beaten the diode horse to death here. Let's talk about MOSFETs. So I'm going to start with a physical drawing of these MOSFETs on a silicon substrate. It's important to specify this because if you look at power MOSFETs, they're built very differently than what you see on a silicon substrate for CMOS devices. And I'm specifically talking about CMOS logic here. Now the NMOS is going to have N material here, N material here, and then it will have a P substrate, the gate oxide material will go across this here. This is non-conductive oxide. And then across the top, you'll have the gate metal. So this is your gate. Over here, we're going to short some metal across from the body, which is our substrate, to the source. And we're going to call this the source connection. And we're going to be ignoring the body connection. We'll get to that here in a little bit on the symbols. But on this side, we're only going to connect the drain. These are the connections that we need to worry about for a standard N-channel MOSFET. Switching over to the P-channel MOSFET, we're going to cut away here. My squiggles on the end are supposed to indicate that the substrate keeps on going in either direction. We're just looking at a slice of one MOSFET. So for a P-channel MOSFET, we need to make a well. And a well is a whole bunch of N-type material. And here's our P substrate down here. Then we have our 
P material here and P material here. Our gate oxide that's non-conductive and our gate. So we have the gate here, gate. We're going to draw this basically the same way. There's our drain. And we're going to be shorting both of these together. And we're going to call that our source. So now looking at these two, they look practically identical. We just have the N's and P's flopped around. And honestly, that's all it really is. I wanted to show both N-channel and P-channel MOSFETs here and give you a refresher of both because most of us in school spend a lot of time on N-channel MOSFETs and learning a lot about amplifiers and using these, but we don't touch on PFETs all that often. And whenever you're using CMOS logic, both of these come into play. They're extremely similar, so they're actually really easy to pick up if you're not comfortable with P-channel MOSFETs, but that's why I'm doing this. The typical symbol drawn for a MOSFET is going to be this is the typical symbol for an N-channel MOSFET and this is the typical symbol for a P-channel MOSFET. One of the things that's really important to remember with MOSFETs is that Whenever you're looking at this, until the body is connected somewhere, there is no defined source or drain. Again, not talking about power MOSFETs here because those are constructed differently. When we're looking at the construction of this MOSFET, if you don't short this N material to the P material here using this metal, then it's not going to be the source necessarily. The source will be where the most negative connection is. So typically this source is going to be connected to ground. So in our symbol down here, we have a gate and we have the body. And here we have the gate and we have the body. But as it's currently drawn, my symbols don't match up to my real devices. And to be clear here, the body is this P material here. And over on the PFET, the body is this N material here. The body is where the channel is going to form and where our current is going to flow. So the way we define a source and a drain is by taking one end of our device and shorting it from the end material to the P material here. So our body is shorted to one end of the channel. And that is drawn like this and like this. So now you can see how these match up. The body is shorted across, and that makes this the source, which is exactly the same on a PFET. And the drain is the side that is not shorted to the body. Now, in a lot of circuits, in a lot of digital circuits, this body will not be connected directly to the source. This body may be connected straight to ground for an N-channel MOSFET, and for a P-channel MOSFET, it'll be connected directly to VCC. There are also other configurations that can be done, but we're not going to worry about those. We're just going to be talking about the general operation of the MOSFET. So that's getting a little bit outside the realm of a quick review. There is one more thing I want to show here, and one of the main reasons I wanted to draw the structure here is that there are diodes inside of MOSFETs. On both sides here, you have an N to P junction. You have a PN junction here and a PN junction here. And these are essentially diodes. So right here we've got, it's kind of hard to draw the way I did it, but we've got a diode like this. And right here we have a diode like this. And our diodes, are those are real diodes that can be turned on so if you were to connect a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here, you would end up with a diode conducting current straight through this device. And that's something you definitely don't want to do. So the way you avoid doing that is you connect your P material 
to the most negative part of your circuit. And over here, we're going to connect our end material to the most positive part of our circuit. But I want to show where these diodes are and how you figure this out. So you have this N-channel MOSFET. That means the material here is N and the P material is the body. So that means the body is going to have the P side, the positive side, and the drain will have the negative side. So in all N-channel MOSFETs, you're going to have this parasitic diode. In all P-channel MOSFETs, you're going to have the opposite. The N is the body material, and the P is the channel material. So now you have a diode going the opposite direction. And those diodes are going to be important whenever we talk about CMOS logic and exactly how some of the parts of it work, especially the inputs and the outputs. Now that we've covered just the basic structure of these, let's look at their basic operation. For simplicity, I'm going to draw these a little bit easier with the simplified version. This symbol implies that the source is shorted to the body. And I'm drawing these in the orientation that you're most likely to see them in a circuit. Typically, you're going to see the source of an N-channel MOSFET connected to ground, and you're going to see the source of a P-channel MOSFET connected to VCC. The control voltage for an N-channel MOSFET is VGS. It's the voltage from the gate to the source. And on a P-channel MOSFET, the control voltage is VSG. We're doing exactly the same thing on both. We're applying a voltage to the gate that's going to be measured relative to the source. In the P-channel MOSFET, we're measuring the voltage relative to the source also. We're looking at the difference from VCC to the gate. As you increase this, the device is eventually going to turn on. And that gate voltage is going to determine how much current can flow through this MOSFET. We're kind of ignoring the drain connection and what our loading is right now. The current is not just going to be related to the gate voltage. It's also going to be related to the amount of voltage across the drain source connection. So we call this on the MOSFET. On the NMOS, this is VDS. And on the P-channel MOSFET, this is VSD. In either case, the current is called drain current, or just ID. It looks like there's a lot going on here, but it's not really that complicated when it comes to CMOS logic, because the inputs to these, the gates, are almost always going to be connected to either VCC or ground. So in the case where you have the gate of a PFET connected to VCC, the voltage VSG is zero. If you have VCC up here and you have VCC at the input here, that's going to make zero volts and this device is biased to be turned off. It's in the cutoff region of operation. If you applied the same voltage over on our N-channel MOSFET, applying VCC here, then the voltage from the gate to the source is very large. It's the entire supply. That means this device is turned on. So you can see that these are operating in opposite states depending on what the input voltage is. If we change this voltage to zero volts, then this would be off because the voltage between the gate and the source is zero. However, if we take this voltage on the PFET and change this to zero volts, then we're going to see a VSG of VCC, and that means this device is turned on as much as it can. With our N-channel MOSFET, assuming that VGS is some constant value large enough to turn on the device, and our VDS is being swept 
from zero and up, we can look at exactly how the current's going to act. So as we sweep VDS up, we're going to see that the, the current increases and kind of levels off. And that shouldn't go back down, that's just my bad drawing. But this level section over here is called the saturation region. This is where our MOSFET is acting a lot like a constant current source. As we increase VDS, we're going to see that the current remains relatively constant. Technically, it's going to continue to increase a little bit, but for our purposes, we don't need to worry about that. Whenever we're below this, that's called the ohmic region, and that's where the device is going to be acting a lot like a resistor. Now, this voltage where this transition happens down here is our supply voltage, whatever the gate is, VCC, minus the threshold of the device. Now, if we were to do the exact same thing with an, a P-channel MOSFET, assuming that we're measuring VSD instead of VDS, assuming that our control voltage is VCC again, so this would actually mean a different voltage on the gate. Remember, the end channel would be VCC to turn it on all the way. The P channel would have zero volts on the input to turn it on all the way. But the voltage across VSG is VCC. As we increase VSD across the MOSFET, we're going to see that it follows the same curve, assuming that the MOSFET has the same design characteristics. The same point is going to switch between the saturation region and the ohmic region, and we're going to have a similar point down here. We're going to see this point is VCC minus VTP. It's going to depend on the threshold of the P-channel device instead of the N-channel device, which are often a little bit different. However, I just wanted to show how similar these operate. Now, if you're measuring VDS, as often these plots are done, you'll see this curve go off the opposite direction because the value becomes negative. However, when you reverse the polarity, they line up perfectly and they work the same. So if you've ever heard in school that these things work the same, this is what was meant by that. Now, I want to show one more thing that's very commonly overlooked is that what happens whenever you start going the other direction. So if I've got VGS equal to VCC, as I start to apply a negative voltage across my channel, what's going to happen? Well, we would expect it to do the same thing. Realistically, we would expect this to happen because the device is symmetrical. Physically, it's the same thing no matter which way you're trying to run current through it. However, realistically, there's also a diode in there. So actually what's going to happen is you're going to be able to go negative a little bit and see current flow the opposite direction. And then you're never actually going to go into saturation because you can't saturate that diode. As you get more and more voltage, the diode can turn on and you can start to see current get higher and higher and higher. The same thing is true for an N-channel MOSFET. It also has a diode and the diode is going to start to conduct when you start to go in the reverse direction across the MOSFET. This has been a really quick refresher on diodes and MOSFETs. Next time we're going to be talking about how you can apply this information to real CMOS logic devices and you can use the datasheet values to try to figure out exactly the behavior of a logic device. Thanks for watching.